Hi there, Smart Drivers talking to you tonight about the driving examiner, that person that sits in the car with you, writes nasty things about you on a clipboard, has one eye in the middle of their forehead, and a few teeth missing. At least, that's your perception. <laughs> Stick around, we'll be right back with that information. Hi there, Smart Drivers. Welcome back. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you tonight about driving examiners, the gatekeepers, the people that decide whether you pass your driving test or whether you fail your driving test. And in many cases, if you've had a bit of driver education, you're going to pass your driver's test. So Z is here. Mallory is here. My friend uh, Corey is here. Bricks for Wheels. Corey is the moderator. Does an excellent, excellent job of getting up. Uh, videos that I suggest you have a look at for further explanation of questions you ask me and the way that it works here at Smart Drive Test during the live stream. Uh, we do a bit of a presentation, about 10 to 12 minutes, and then we come back in the remainder of the hour. We answer any questions that you might have about passing a driver's test, being a safer, smarter driver, or starting a career as a truck or bus driver. And I will say that the truck driving industry has been in the news heaps and heaps and heaps. <laughs> and we're not just talking about truck drivers with the Freedom Convoy and the protesters at the Ambassador Bridge in Ontario and the protesters in Ottawa and other major border crossings across Canada. But we're also talking about the Times Magazine article on truck drivers why women are not involved in truck driving, why there is a driver retention problem, and as well, there was another article uh, with the problem of training in the New York Times. So the big media outlets are now spotlighting truck drivers, they're spotlighting the driver retention uh, issue that we're having, and because of those articles, as well, I'm on a mailing list for the news truck trucker news i think it is our fleet news i believe it is i'd have to look it up anyway and uh they did an article in response to the times magazine article and i haven't done a close reading of the times magazine article but what they were saying was that you know it was a bit critical of the trucking industry but i would tend to err on the side of the times magazine article and say that in fact they were more spot on than what the industry would like to think the other reasons for <coughs> excuse me the other reasons for these articles and focus on trucking right now is because the United States has brought in mandatory entry level training which has been brought here in Canada. This is a response of years of talking about this and of course as we know politicians do not enact legislation to heap more rules and regulations on people because it doesn't bode well for them getting reelected, and so they do what the fence sitting is <laughs> and uh, they drag their heels as much as they can until they're absolutely forced to do something. So they finally brought in the mandatory entry-level training in the States. And, of course, the industry's all up in arms about this because how do they do this? So this is, this is what's going on with the focus on trucking, truck driving in the United States and Canada and North America right now. All right, so Tim is here for watching from Winnipeg. Jim is here. Uh, Willie did, in fact, pass his driver's test. Uh, is because they don't observe well uh, life. That is one of the reasons why they won't pass their driver's test. There's a number of reasons why they won't pass the driver's test, and we'll talk about that. DC, hello, my friend. How are you? And uh, if you want to talk about anything in the world of driving, truck driving, mandatory entry level training, and those types of things, uh, that would be great. The other thing that they're talking about in the United States is they're going to lower the age for a CDL license. They're lowering it from 21 to 18 years old. So in your late teens, you can now get your CDL license and drive. And I would also argue one of the other reasons that they say that trucking is not the great profession that it once was is because of deregulation, which happened in the 1990s, which means that the government no longer had control and it was up to capitalism and whatnot, and that we just put hundreds of thousands of tractor trailers on the road, which we did, which big business did, because there's a reason for that, and we can talk about that later if you're interested in trucking and why <laughs> trucking is making the news right now. 
So, a few people here, and I think that we're not going to have that many people here tonight because tomorrow is the day of love and romance. Yes, it's Valentine's Day. <laughs> and interesting enough, I've been watching the Green Arrow series on Prime Television and, of course, Cupid. They have one of the uh, DC Comics <laughs> arch villains. <laughs> it's uh, Cupid stupid. All right, so Pearson is here as well. Hello, hello, hello. So without further ado, we'll get over to the slideshow presentation. Like I said, lots of people are not doing their driver's test tomorrow or during this week because it's the week of love, because it's Valentine's Day. But we shall soldier forward, and for those people who are, in fact, going to get their driver's license, uh, do their test here in the next couple of weeks, we will help you out with that. And congratulations and kudos to all of those people who are, in fact going to take the driver's test because there's a little secret that'll let you in on. It's actually easier in the winter time to get your driver's license. And of course, <laughs> I've been posting this video up on TikTok. It got a lot of views and some of the comments are back. They're like, this is why we have so many crappy drivers on the road. <laughs> you know, social media. You know, people are so nice and lovely on social media. No, they're just like, <laughs> And uh, no, in fact, learning to drive in the wintertime requires a higher skill set. So if you, in fact, do learn to drive in the wintertime, you have a higher skill set. Just because the competency test isn't what you think it should be, uh, because they, you know, there's big snow banks along the road and those types of things, and they, up to the discretion of the examiner, we're going to talk about this, the examiner has a great deal of discretion on what you're going to do for the test. And if there's a lot of snow on the road and you have huge snow banks, they may just say, listen, we're not going to we're not going to parallel park. We're just going to get you to do a three point turn. So there are reasons for taking your driver's test in the wintertime. It's a bit easier because you have to have a higher skill set because you're driving on slippery roads, snow and ice. So I do encourage all of those people who are taking their driver's test in the wintertime to, in fact, take your driver's test. And kudos to you for having the brass to do it, because the other thing about it is summer's coming. And I can tell you from this channel, from running this channel now from five years, that July, August, and the first two weeks in September are the busiest times of the year. The channel just goes like crazy over the moon. And everybody and their dog is taking a driver's test. Dogs can't drive. It's just a, that's a funny, it's a punny funny. But everybody's taking their driver's test. Driving examiners in the summertime are completely and utterly stressed out. They have very little time to do the tests. I mean, now in Ontario, they're trying to play catch up after two years of COVID. And I have heard that they have an exact amount of time. It's like 17 minutes to do a driver's test. This puts extra stress on the driving instructor or the driving examiners rather. And they're not, <laughs> they're not super chill. They're just like trying to get through the driving test as quickly as they can. So this is what's happening with the driver's test. So, you want to try and take it now, take it in the spring, take it before the big rush, because not only is it gonna be a little bit more difficult to actually get a driver's test date, but the examiners are going to be a little bit more stressed, okay? And we'll talk more about all of that, okay? So, uh, life is taking his on the 15th of March, that's great. Hello, my friend Tim, Drive Smart BC. If you are in the province of British Columbia, and you want to know anything about traffic safety, you want to know anything about policing, courts, uh, major decisions made within the courts, definitely check out Tim's site, Drive Smart BC, as well. He's an excellent forum over there that you can participate in and discuss topics with other leading experts in the field, driver education, traffic safety, policing, those types of things. So check out Tim's website. Okay, further ado, let's get through the presentation. I'll come back and we'll start answering your questions. All right, so driving examiners, their job, and what is your job in response to the driving examiner's job? And uh, this woman here, I can tell you right now, did not pass a driver's test. That's the look of, I wasn't successful, and the driving examiner <laughs> is trying to give me a debrief, and you're not listening <laughs> because all you heard was you failed. But because, like social media, everybody is so nice and warm and fuzzy, the other thing that they're now doing in the state of New York, the city of New York and other places is because students are, some students, not all students, are belligerent and 
aggressive and abusive towards the driving examiners, you now take your test and then you have to wait until six o'clock in the afternoon and then you log on the DMV website and you find out whether you pass or fail. Uh, excellent, all right. So for those of you new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I was a truck driver in the 1990s pulling freight between Canada and the United States up and down through the Eastern Seaboard. And yes, the Ambassador Bridge, which the protesters have blocked and the police have recently cleared. We could talk about policing too, if you want to, uh, after we're done the presentation. Uh, went across the Ambassador Bridge a lot going into the United States when I was truck driving. Uh, became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997 in a bid to come off the road. Uh, 2006, I graduated from the University of Melbourne in Australia with my doctorate in legal history, which is a study of policing, courts, and prisons. My expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic, oddly enough. While I was going to university in Australia, I drove buses for Greyhound and one of the regional bus lines there as well, uh, part-time. And in 2015, I started the Smart Drive Test online business and YouTube channel and it has been wildly more successful than I could have imagined. This year we're branching out with one short every day until October, because that was my commitment of one short a day and trying to help more people be successful in passing their driver's test, becoming uh, smarter, safer drivers, starting careers as truck or bus drivers. We're working with Chloe right now. Uh, she is a driver's test in early March uh, and uh, we worked on some parking, reverse parking, Reverse stall parking or perpendicular parking, it has different names depending on what your driving instructor is going to say to you or the DMV where you're going. And uh, we're working with her, uh, helping her out. And as well, we're some narrow, curvy roads along the lake and some beautiful views out where she lives. She lives way out on one of the peninsulas here <laughs> uh, in Vernon and uh, really, really awesome. And uh, yeah, she backed into a snowbank on the driver's lesson as well. And uh, as I say, Driving lessons are the place to fall down. Don't do that on your driver's test. <laughs> so yes, in the winter time, even though kudos for you taking your driver's test in the winter time, don't back into snow banks, okay? That's an automatic fail on your driver's test. Driving examiners, what is their job during the driving tests? Their job is to assess your ability to have due care and control of the vehicle in changing traffic conditions. And this includes your parking maneuvers as well. Parallel parking, backing into a parking space, three-point turns, backing around a corner, all of those types of things. This is what the driving examiner's job. Your job is to take away the driving examiner's right to fail you. Nothing less, nothing more. That's all you have to do is take away their right to fail you. First impressions, yes, put on some nice clothes. Don't wear ripped jeans. <laughs> I was in Lululemon yesterday, which is a high-end clothing store, and they're sponsoring the Canadian Olympic team right now. And I was standing there, and of course, it's not a, it's a high-end store, right? Lululemon. And there was a young woman standing behind me, and she didn't just have ripped jeans on. The whole front of her pant leg was missing. So I would suggest that you not wear those pants when you show up for your driving test, okay? So first impressions matter as well in this day of COVID. It's winter time. Your car is filthy. Just take it down and spray it off. Vacuum it out. Get all the dirt out of it and those types of things. Uh, next thing as well, oh, I'll talk about that in a second. Myths about driving examiners. Watch the video, the second or the driving test day with Charlie. <laughs> we went to Salmon Arm, and Charlie says, "Oh, there's a guy here with a monocle, and if you get the guy with the monocle, you're gonna fail your driver's test." <laughs> it's not true. It's not true. Okay. So myths about driving examiners. Don't wear sunglasses. Okay. And driving instructors perpetuate this myth all the time. Okay, if you need sunglasses to drive in bright sun on bright sunny days, wear sunglasses. I can't drive on bright sunny days without sunglasses. I have two or three extra pairs of sunglasses in my car. So if you need sunglasses, wear sunglasses. Don't engage in conversation. I would add to that not to engage in conversation right off the bat. Usually about midway through the test, when the examiner is comfortable with your driving and has made the decision that you have passed your driver's test, they might engage in conversation. But I would say to you, let the examiner take the lead on the 
conversation. Examiners work to fail you. That is not true. They have, <laughs> they have bosses, they have managers, they have supervisors to whom they have to answer to. They cannot fail you. They don't have a quota, okay? It's based on your driving ability. And no, they are not working to fail you. Yes, they're, they put on their pants one, day, one leg at a time, just like all of the rest of us. And they have bad days and those types of things. So yes, maybe they might be a bit crotchety. But again, we come back to focus on what you're doing. Focus on your job, which is to take away their right to fail you. Okay? I have to speak English perfectly. Examiners are unfair. None of these things are true. All right? And as well, uh, Sam and I, the lesson we did in New York, if you make a mistake on your test, don't get flustered by it just take a breath carry on do what you need to do because the driving examiner may or may not have seen it all right have a look at these two videos the most common mistakes automatic fails on a driver's test there's two ways that you can fail a driver's test you can fail a driver's test automatically blocking the box i just put up a short here the other uh, no i haven't put it up yet maybe i did yes i did put it up it's a short on don't block the box don't drive into an intersection you can't clear. Uh, disobeying regulatory signs, uh, not stopping for emergency vehicles. These are just some of the ways that you can fail a driver's test outright. The other way is to accumulate demerits. Most driving tests are around the 35 point mark. You get assigned, say, improper left turn. You get assigned 10 points or not stopping at the stop correct stopping position. Then, uh, that's another five points. You deviate in your lane, another five points. So if you accumulate 35 points, you've failed your driver's test. Okay, as well, before you show up, I talked about this before, cleaning your vehicle, make sure that you do a pre-trip inspection as well. When you show up for your driver's test, the driving examiner is going to do a pre-trip inspection on your vehicle, regardless of whether it's your personal vehicle or whether it is a driving school car. They will check the license plates, check to make sure that the tags are valid. They will check the glass, make sure that there aren't any chips, cracks, or breaks in the glass. They're going to check to make sure your lights work, your signals work, your brake light, brake lights work, your horn works. They're going to make sure that the doors open and close on the passenger side. That's important because that's where the examiner is going to get in as well. They're going to check to make sure that the seatbelt works and the vehicle is clean because, again, in this day and age of COVID, they could deny you your test because your vehicle is not clean. They won't get in it <laughs> because they feel unsafe and they have every right to do that for the purposes of the driver's test. So have a look at all of that. Road signs. Again, practice in and around the test center where you're going to be taking your test. Know the signs. Failing to adjust speed according to signs. The lane ends, you don't merge properly. Stop signs, you don't come to the uh, correct stop at the correct stopping position school zone signs if school is in session and you don't do the speed limit in a school zone that is an automatic fail on a driver's test road markings as well <laughs> know the difference between white lines and yellow lines in North America that is important <laughs> that you know that little bit of information all right slow speed maneuvers turning parking and maneuvering there are only three states in the U.S. that I am aware of that don't parallel park. Maryland, California, and Ohio. Those are the only three that I know of. And as well, the state of Oregon will sometimes get you to back along a curb for approximately 50 feet. That's the only confirmed information I have. There is some information out there with some of the media, leading media sources, but it's not true. I haven't heard that. In the state of Kentucky... I have heard that you have to back around a corner. You have to do the two-point reverse turn. So, parallel parking. Know how to parallel park. Know how to back into a parking space and know how to do a three-point turn. You can be almost guaranteed that you're going to have to do those three maneuvers for the purposes of your driver's test. Everything else is up to the discretion of the examiner. Everything else is up to the discretion of the examiner. I'm going to repeat that because that's important. You need to know how to do these. If you haven't done a two-point reverse turn and the examiner says, I want you to do a two-point reverse turn or I want you to back around the corner, then you have to do that because that's what the examiner asks you to do. So know that. As well, slow speed maneuvers will improve your overall driving 80%. 
80%. Okay? So if you focus on your slow speed maneuvers, the rest of it's going to improve. So I would suggest to you that you put your energies there for at least one or two lessons. That will improve your overall driving. Lane positioning. Right lane to right lane when you're turning. Left lane to left lane when you're turning, okay? Merging lanes, moving, moving the vehicle laterally, communicating, okay? You have to signal, you have to shoulder check every time you turn, every time you move the vehicle laterally. And as I say about shoulder checking, which is the most important thing, and it's the reason you're gonna demerit out on your driver's test, not shoulder checking is to driving what not checking to see if a weapon is loaded is to gun safety, okay? Why would you take a two-ton vehicle at speed, move it sideways or turn and not shoulder check in the same way that you would pick up a rifle and not check to see whether it's got bullets in it, <laughs> okay? Both are equally dangerous. Please shoulder check. The driving examiners to assess competency, score demerit points, pass or fail, and they will give you a debrief on skills that need to be improved to keep you safe while you're driving because driving is dangerous. All right, we'll talk more about that, how to make you a safer, smarter driver. So good luck on your driver's test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. We'll get back over here. All right. Mallory, when I was a little girl, I went for a ride in a big truck around the community where my dad grew up that was really cool from the passenger seat. Yes, lots of people like riding in big trucks, Mallory, and it's really cool. <laughs> I've actually had people just come into the driving school and rent the truck for an hour, the instructor, and just they just want the instructor to take them for a drive. So people love big trucks. There's absolutely no, no doubt about that for sure. So Corey's put the videos up that I suggested. Uh, Tyler, what if a person's cloth seats are a magnet? to hair but impossible to get it removed would the examiner not let you take a test no uh tyler that's not going to prevent you from getting a test the other thing maybe you could do tyler is just maybe put a seat cover on it or you could get one of those uh, rolly brushes that get lint off uh, your jackets and those types of things uh, that's another way you could get rid of the hair uh, jassy says people don't parallel park in louisiana much uh, jassy people don't parallel park much after they get their license across the board. It's not just the great state of Louisiana. Uh, it's all over the place that people don't do it, but it is a requirement for the purposes of the driver's test and driving examiners could ask you to do it. Not in the state of California because somebody really had a go at me once about that. <laughs> you know, people are so warm and fuzzy on the internet when they disagree with you. No, it's we can't have a debate. We're just gonna tear you apart. I'm just gonna... People are not nice when they're sitting behind a computer. Anyway, uh, what about under speed limit in school zones? Uh, you can go under the posted speed limit in a school zone, but you can like only a couple of miles an hour, okay? Be careful with that. Uh, Jassy, how do you get comfortable driving on the highway? Uh, Jassy, of course, it's practice, but also I would suggest to get that practice of driving on the highway go out early in the morning or later at night uh, when there aren't a lot of when there isn't a lot of traffic rather and you can get more comfortable with it and, you know looking farther down the road managing your space better make sure that you have that kind of three second following distance or 10 car lengths uh, between you and other traffic stay out of the clusters all of that will help you out to drive on the highway and the other piece that I suggest for getting comfortable with driving on highways is to go with somebody you trust who's a veteran driver, your mom, your dad, your uncle, somebody like that, who can sit and give you some feedback about your driving, you know, suggest better space management, uh, you know, driving down the road and those types of things. All right. My friend Joe, how are you? I'm sorry I didn't get back to you on the email. I did get your email. That was great that your son passed on the 16th. Uh, Oh, the 16th is when you go for your air brakes. Awesome. And your son recently passed his G2. I did appreciate all of that information. Uh, yes, and practice. <laughs> uh, and thank you for the endorsement as well, Joe. That's absolutely great. Thank you so much. And uh, HG, uh, how do you know when to shoulder check? Corey will put up the video for you on shoulder checking. But the general rule of for driving to shoulder check is anytime you move the vehicle sideways 
or any time that you're turning, you have to do two shoulder checks minimum, okay? Ch lane changes as well. You're gonna have to do minimum two shoulder checks. And shoulder checks are just quick, quick turn to the head. It's like that. New drivers have the mistake or the mistaken idea that when they're turning their head, they're actually looking out there, they're actually studying. Our eyes are attracted to light and movement. So what happens is, is we look here and if something catches our eye, for example, there's a cyclist or a pedestrian walking up there, then we look and we kind of catch that and we're like, oh wait, something's not right over there. Then we turn and we look and we, oh, there's a cyclist there. I need to be aware of that cyclist or on the other, obviously it's gonna be more likely it's on this side, on the right side, but that's what you're looking for when you're shoulder checking. All right. Uh, Tyler, I take my car on the highway to do an Italian tune-up to remove carbon. <laughs> uh, Tyler, they're not so carboned up anymore, not like they used to be in the old days. Uh, but it does happen, and yes, you do want to get them out and have them go for a run for sure. Uh, all right, Oscar, I am hope I'm passing my road test. Can I practice where I'm having the test on the day it's closed? Uh, Oscar, yes, and that's a great question. You don't want to go into the DMV or the test center when the office is open. You can't do that, okay? They will get upset, you're in the way, those types of things. But when the office is closed after hours or on the weekend, then you are more than welcome to go into the test center and practice backing into the parking spaces as well. Figure out what's on the driver's test because different test centers are gonna have different requirements, for example, uh, some test centers will get you to parallel park between cones. We have a video here on parallel parking with cones and they will get you to do that at the test center. When I did my driving, uh, driving instructors test in the city of Ottawa in Canada where the Freedom Convoy is right now, uh, we parallel parked off a concrete barrier. So there was a concrete barrier there. We had to pull up beside it and then parallel park in behind the concrete barrier. That's the other piece to being successful on your driver's test is knowing what's on the test at the test center where you're taking your test. Some places, there's a bug in my cup, <laughs> in my water cup. Not sure where he went, but anyway, he's not floating around in there. There we go. Uh, I digress. Some Test centers in the US are still doing the parking lot slow speed maneuvers test. And some of these are just gonna be some cones that are set up and they're gonna get you to do some slow speed maneuvers. The Ohio maneuverability test, if you're in the state of Ohio, parallel parking, two point reverse turn, those types of things. Other test centers in the US are going to have a mini driving course. They'll have roads, they'll have a right turn, a left turn, they'll have stop signs, yield signs, those types of things that you'll have to do the driver's test in there. And I have a video on slow speed maneuvers in a parking lot that some of these places are still doing. For the most part, they're not doing these. They're, they're back on the road for the most part, but there are some places that they're still doing this, okay? So know that, figure out what the requirements of the test are at your test center. And if you don't know and you can't figure it out, that bug is, oh, there he's gone. <laughs> He's gone now. I just booted him on the floor. Uh, so if you can't figure out what it is and you don't know, hire a driving instructor from a local school. Yes, it's going to cost you 100 bucks, 150 bucks. However, the return on investment from hiring a driving instructor and taking a lesson is is the return on investment is very very high. It exponentially increases your chances of passing your driver's test. Okay. Corey's put up the video there on closed circuit testing, so have a look at that. Uh, Tyler, would examiners not let you take your test if your shock bounce like an Uncle Buck's car for safety reasons? <laughs> uh, Tyler, they're not really going to know that un unless you go over some bumps and those types of things. But, uh, you know, if you got one of those, I don't even know what they're called, but, you know, you used to see those old cars in the movies where they come up and they do that bouncy thing. Uh, yeah, that's probably not good. Uh, you might want to find a better, more reliable automobile for the purposes of your driver's test. So, 
Uh, Wendy, how do I define slack adjusters? I can identify them, just can't define them for the purposes of the test on the 16th. Uh, identify them. Okay. Uh, slack adjusters. Okay, Wendy, most slack adjusters on air brake equipped vehicles are going to be automatic in this day and age. Unless it's a training vehicle or you have one of those stands with a drum brake on it and an air brake chamber and a push rod and a slack adjuster, it's going to be an automatic slack adjuster. I don't know. I, are you in the province of British Columbia? Because in the British in, in British Columbia here, you have to know how to adjust a slack a manual slack. I don't know anywhere else that you have to do that. But the slack adjuster, you have the brake chamber, the push rod, the rod that comes out of the chamber. What that attached to? There's a clevis pin here. It's just a U-shaped thing that's attached to the top of the slack adjuster, and then the slack adjuster is attached to the S cam. So that's how you're going to know, all right, that you that 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 is what a, a slack adjuster is. Just look at pictures. Type into Google uh, air brake slack adjuster. Look at the images and you'll figure out what a slack adjuster is pretty quickly. Uh, it's part of the foundation components of the air brake system. Uh, excellent. Okay. Uh, GHHG, uh, what if you do everything right except the parallel parking? Okay. And again, here's another, that's an excellent question. Here's an, a, a point about that. For the purposes of the driver's test, you are not going for perfection, okay? It's very rare that students don't get uh, some marks detected for the purposes of the driver's test. And you know, unless it's a completely chill, completely relaxed, or you just had a really awesome run on your driver's test. You're not going for protect, per, for perfection, you're going for pass, okay? You just need the pass. That's all you're doing. So, the parallel parking, if you just get in behind the car or you're too, too far from the curb, uh, look at the video with me failing the driver's test in New York with Sam, okay? I was too far from the curb, he gave me five points. If you get five points for the purposes of parallel parking, no big deal, okay? Because sometimes if you get in there and then you try to adjust or those types of things, that you're just going to mess it up even more and you're going to get assigned too many points. You are allowed one pull up on parking maneuvers without being assigned points. Okay? Know that. So just get it in there. And if you get five points or ten points, it's not the end of the world. All right? You're just going for the pass. That's what you're doing for the purposes of your driver's test. Uh, Tim, you should know how to adjust an auto slack manually too. Uh, Tim, I completely, utterly disagree with that because if there is, if you're adjusting an automatic slack adjuster, there's something wrong with it. And the instant that you adjust it and then you make a brake application, it just goes back out of adjustment anyway. So I tell students not to adjust automatic slacks. And as in my mind, uh, drivers shouldn't be messing with automatic slacks uh, because it, like I said, if they're out of adjustment, there's something wrong with them and they need to be replaced by a qualified technician. Uh, Joe, uh, my son practiced parallel parking for at least a dozen hours, trying different ways of doing it, but not getting it. He was frustrated that one day everything just clicked and yeah, any that's happens with anything, Joe, it's like you try something and try something and try something and it doesn't work. And then uh, one day after trying and trying, it just happens to all work out for you. Uh, Crystal, I did not get to do my public speaking on Monday because they cut us off without telling us. Uh, Crystal, well, that's unfortunate. Who was they that just kind of cut you off? Uh, Wendy, New Jersey, the question on the test could be what is a slack adjuster? So I'm trying to define it correctly because um, what is a slack adjuster? Okay. What is a slack adjuster? A slack adjuster is exactly what it is. It adjusts slack in the braking system. So the discs or the brake pads wear and then you have to compensate for that wear on the brake pad and the slack adjuster, that, that wear is called slack, that slack adjuster takes up that slack. It gives you a means of adjusting for that slack. Now, let me try and think of some, uh, some analogy. Uh, to do that. 
Uh, <laughs> I agree, Tim. I agree uh, with what you're saying. But the the how I come at it is, is if you know you've got ten brakes on a tandem tandem truck, you've got ten brakes, and if one's out of adjustment, it's not going to be a huge deal until you get into the uh, mechanic and you get it fixed. Now, obviously, that's where you should be going, right? Not driving from Winnipeg to Vancouver and then waiting until you get Vancouver to get it in and get it checked, right? You should be as soon as you know you figure out that your slack adjuster, your automatic slack adjuster is not working. You should be heading to the shop like right away. For sure. Uh, Adele, uh, know how to properly brake without the car behind you slamming into you, especially when the, uh, they tailgate you. How? Also, how do I know if I'm in the center of the lane? Adele, I was thinking about you today, was working on your question. I'm making a short for that, uh, but I will answer that for you here in just a sec. Just, um, I'm trying to think of an analogy for the slack adjuster that allows you to take up slack in something. Uh, something that needs an adjustment. I'm coming, I'm working on it. Uh, Epic, how about doing a driving school road test service that will include practice by the test site, then the actual road test, the way you get the pass, the driver's exam and pass the road test. And absolutely Epic, that's what I'm talking about is, is that uh, do a mock road test with a local driving school exactly what you're talking about say to them listen i want to practice driving test i'm going for my driving test in three weeks or two weeks or whatever uh, i want you to do an evaluation of my skills i want you to take me on the driving test route and show me what maneuvers are required for the purposes of my test and that is excellent advice this is what i tell all kinds of students because the um Mock road test is the best money that you can invest in getting ready for your driving test, especially if you're not taking driver training. If you are taking driver training already, the driving instructor is going to do those things for you. They're going to take you on the test route. They're going to show you where the examiners do the maneuvers because, uh, for example, I live in a small town here. They have the same place where they kind of do the three-point turns, the parallel parking, those types of things because it's just easier. They know where the kind of roads there isn't a lot of traffic on for the purposes of doing the three point turns and whatnot. And this is all the stuff that they want you to do, okay? Uh, Corey, that's exactly right. It tightens the brake to offset the gradual wear. And it does that through a rat ratchet mechanism. Now the old manual slacks, you had to do it manually. You had to get under there with a 916 wrench and do it manually. But the new ones do it automatically that there's a ratchet mechanism inside the automatic slack adjuster. Once it detects so much travel between the brake pad and the drum where it makes contact for friction, once it detects, it'll ratchet over to the next position to compensate for that wear. And I'm trying to think of something that's an analogy, uh, you know, in my head that will kind of explain how that does. Uh, Tim, how about the handbrakes on your bicycle? The adjuster there does the same thing. Yes. Excellent. So I don't know how many people know about the handbrakes on their bicycle. There's a ring there uh, that you can turn and you can stretch the cable out a little bit. That ring on the bicycle adjusts for the wear on the brake pads. Exactly what Tim just said. Thank you for that, Tim. It does the similar thing as the slack adjuster in the air brake system. Uh, Wolf uh, Treads, difference between Alberta and BC driving. Uh, treads, there's very little difference between uh, the two provinces. They're almost identical uh, for driver's tests. Uh, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. You know, all the road signs are the same. <laughs> Driving's the same. Uh, and if you've driven in the city of Calgary, you're going to know that there's a lot of merging in Calgary because they have a lot of uh, multi-lane highways and merging and those types of things. <laughs> Tim says, I still have my brake buddy tool in my collection. I never liked those things, Tim. I always, I just looked at them and went, oh, that is dangerous. That is going to knock me in the head. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Wendy, thank you because I seriously doubt a uh, thingy that can't move one inch is not going to get me passing grade. <laughs> uh, Wendy, you are most welcome. We're happy to be able to help out with the definition of a slack adjuster. I'm just trying to come up with an analogy because I'm always trying to come up with uh, better ways of explaining uh, slack adjusters to you, but Corey had the best 
uh, definition there uh, of exactly what it was. So, uh, Wolf Tank, our treads, I let my, let my license lapse moving from Alberta to Kelowna eight years ago because they didn't need it. I am again having to take the driving test as I'm moving to Columbia Valley. Uh, there aren't any, and as I said, there aren't any major differences between the province of Alberta and the province of British Columbia here. Uh, Gamer, uh, how should you manage to merge onto a highway safely with a lot of cars going high speeds in it? Okay, so Gamer, this is this is a, f a frequent question that I get about merging onto highways and freeways, okay? So you're coming out onto the on-ramp, and there's a couple of, there's a whole playlist here of videos about merging out onto the highway. Match the speed of the vehicles on the highway or freeway, okay? Get your vehicle up to speed as much as you can. Um, and, you know, if it's backed up and there's a lot of traffic on the highway, it's not going to be going that fast. They're going to be going slower. You get out onto the on-ramp, signal on, and then you crowd that left side of the lane. But the most important piece is as you're coming out on the on-ramp, you got to pick your spot, okay? Because... Say, for example, that you're getting up to speed and you look over and there's a big truck right here, right beside you on the left. And you automatically say to yourself, okay, I'm going to get in behind that big truck. So you're aiming for that. You're watching the big truck. Because remember, we go where we're looking. The car goes where you're looking. So if you see that big truck there and you look at it and you're like, I'm aiming for that and I'm going, you're going to match the speed you're going to hit that space in behind that big truck and you're going to merge. As well, if you have your signal on and you're crowding the left side of the lane, other traffic is going to try and help you out. Okay? A lot of people say, I don't have to. I don't have to. I'm mean. I'm, I'm on social media. I love Facebook. Sort of thing, right? But that's not true. Most of the time, other drivers on the highway, if they can will try and help you out. They will try and move over. They will let off the throttle a little bit. And I'm not saying like when they let off the throttle, they're letting off the throttle like 10 miles an hour. They're letting off the throttle two or three miles an hour because if you let off the throttle two or three miles an hour and you're accelerating, you're speeding up, it goes like this and there's a big gap there and they create a hole for you to move into onto the highway. Good night, my friend Tim. Thank you so much for the help with the air brake explanation. Have a great night. <laughs> and oven mitts. Remember to wear oven mitts, my friend. Sam, my friend. Beautiful Sunday. Hello, everyone. Just hopping on. How are you? Uh, 52, is it cheating if I know the drive test route which is posted on YouTube? Uh, 52, no, it is not cheating. Not cheating at all. Because it doesn't matter if you know the test route already. What matters is, is that you can handle that test route in changing traffic conditions because the traffic conditions are, are going to change. The other piece that I would suggest to you is make sure that you practice at the time when your driver's test is. So if your driver's test is at 8.30 in the morning, make sure you get out on that test route at 8.30 in the morning and practice at that time because 8.30 in the morning, it's going to be rush hour and it's going to be very different than it would be at noon, for example, okay? So practice at the time that you're going to be taking your test. Christina, you're taking your test tomorrow. Good luck on your test tomorrow. Remember to breathe. That will cause your body to relax and make sure that you do the pre-trip inspection on your vehicle before you show up. If you're going with the driving school, make sure you ask the instructor whether he or she as well did a pre-trip inspection on the vehicle because you don't want to be denied for something simple like having a brake light out. Uh, Joe, it was weird uh, driving in Calgary a few years ago since you don't need front plates in Alberta. <laughs> yeah, and there's quite a number of states uh, in the U.S. you don't need front plates as well. Uh, I think actually most of the most of the sta southern states uh, you don't have to have front plates. Uh, actually, those of us Believe it or not, in North America, the lower 48 and Canada, those of us who have front plates, we're the, we're the weird people. We're the weird people. It's everybody else that's more normal than us. <laughs> uh, Tyler, when I first learned to drive, I drove over a rock and broke the tie rod and I was mad. Uh, yes, and that's an excellent point of what Tyler just said about driving over something. Uh, if you can... <clears throat> try and straddle it don't drive over it with the tires 
because as he said, if it's a rock and you drive over it with the tire, you could kick it up underneath the suspension or up under the undercarriage of the vehicle and you potentially could do damage. So try and straddle it, uh, figure out what you're doing. <laughs> you know, you might even wanna drive out onto the shoulder of the road to avoid whatever's on the road because again you don't really know what it is because remember you're traveling at high speeds and uh, until you get very close to it you know you might figure out it's a garbage bag with a big you know statue in it or something especially uh, where I live here you go up the highway the dump is at the top of the hill and even though people are supposed to have the load covered they don't and stuff blows off onto the highway and whatnot so don't drive over it if you can avoid it uh sam next time we do a video in new york i am going to be firm and act like a mean examiner or driving instructor <laughs> sam i really don't think that you have a mean face you really don't strike me as that kind of person you're just you're just big and warm and cuddly you know like a big bear <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just I would like to see that because I would probably just laugh the whole time because you know you're so cuddly <laughs> uh, Wendy said Delaware doesn't have any front plates uh, treads I am taking my test in a very small town which faded with rate yeah faded uh, road markings for sure there's lots of that right now uh, what is my best strategy I have a driving school lesson uh, one week before the test and treads that is awesome that you have a uh, practice driving test with an instructor before your test uh, that's going to just help you and serve you incredibly because they'll be able to take you on the test route they'll show you how to deal with you know the lines and those types of things that aren't on the road and whatnot so uh, that's really great uh, Mallory, just wondering if you have any short videos on slip lanes and painted islands. Uh, not yet, Mallory. I'm working on it. <laughs> it's It's been a lot bigger project than I kind of thought it was going to be, but uh, we're working on it. <coughs> Sam says, and that's why my wife loves me. Yeah, you're just so easy to love. Uh, absolutely, Sam. Uh, Gamer, if my DMV is right next to a highway, should I expect it to be on the driving test? Uh, gamer, yes. If you are right next to a highway, I would be prepared with the skills and techniques to be able to get on the highway and drive safely. Okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> Front railway, uh, railway tracks. Yes. And the other tip, advanced skill that I'll give you about railway crossings, and it's not just railway crossings, overpasses and bridges. All right, there's the normal tracks where the big trucks drive and you get the ruts. And uh, Tim isn't here now, but he did have a, a name, channelization, that's what he called it. You get those ruts and at the railway crossings, on bridges where the expansion joints are, overpasses, those types of things, you want to move to the right to get out of those channels that the big trucks create because you're gonna get huge divots there and you're gonna get huge bumps. And as Joe said, and tread that they broke pieces of their car or tyler rather that they broke pieces of their car stay out of those big bumps and <laughs> you know the other piece with this is watch the traffic in front of you immediately in front of you because if there's a big bump in the road or a divot or something that hasn't been marked yet you'll see the other cars go down into it and uh my friend lives here uh in just in winfield which is another town up the road here and there's coming out of her house there's a big divot <clears throat> and of course she is an audi with a lowered suspension on it and you go over that and the audi just bottoms out so we're coming into that time of the year in the spring with lots of potholes and those types of things in the roadway so you have to figure out how to move these <clears throat> and that's the best way always move to the right and get out of those channels uh, before going over railway crossing bridges or overpasses and that will keep your car nice and bouncy uh, V got off the live stream for a bit could you repeat the answer if you already answered my question excellent thanks for reminding me okay so staying centered in the lane look farther down the road follow other traffic look for the traffic lights look for landmarks when you're going around corners and those types of things uh, that will help you to navigate now as a quick reference for keeping your vehicle centered in the roadway, the fog line that runs up the right side of the road, the solid white line, it, it 
from the driver's perspective, that line should be in the center of the hood if you're centered in the lane when you're driving. All right, so that'll help you to get centered in the lane as well. Corey will put up the video for you on staying centered in the lane and that'll definitely help you out. Uh, treads, if I'm using an Alberta car for a BC road test, will it require a front plate even though front plates aren't required in Alberta? I haven't found any information on ACBC. Uh, treads, yes, you will need a front plate for that vehicle. So you might want to get it converted over before you take it for your driver's test because I have been at driving test centers where somebody borrowed their uncle's car and it was from Alberta and it didn't have a front plate and the driving examiner in BC wouldn't let them go out with it, which is, yeah, I don't agree with, but I don't want you to be denied your driver's test because you've got an Alberta car that doesn't have a front plate. If you're living in BC, I would get it switched over so that way you're not going to be denied your test or find another vehicle that you can borrow to take your test. Uh, Delta, I live in an area where all drivers frequently break the road laws like they aren't even in existence and love to tailgate randomly swerve in front of you. What do I do? Can I drive the lawful limit? Uh, Delta, you live just about anywhere in North America or anywhere in the world because that happens. That is called social driving. People are always going to speed. They're not going to stop completely at stop signed intersections. They're going to cut you off. They're going to pull out in front of you. They're going to tell you that you are number one. All those wonderful things that people do as drivers. So what can you do? Manage space around your vehicle. The more space you have, the fact that you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit something. And if you want more information about what you can do in terms of defensive driving, I would suggest you have a look at the defensive driving smart course I have over at the Smart Drive Test website. Uh, you can pick that up for about 38 bucks US. That will significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash and it will help you to deal with all those crazy people out there on the roadway and give you some information about different crashes uh, defensive driving strategies that you can put in place, driving at night, driving in inclement weather and whatnot. So check out the Defensive Driving Smart course. Corey will put up the link for you and that will help you to deal with social driving. All right. Uh, Crystal, I did not get to do my... Yeah, you said that before. Uh, what was the reason, Crystal? Did they give you a reason why you couldn't do it? Uh, Tyler, I called the Saskatchewan DMV and said... I have my N and they said if I had it for six months, I get my full license since it's the old system there. Uh, Tyler, you need to move to Saskatchewan then you don't have to do a driver's test. Awesome. <clears throat> uh, gamer, what if the highway that is near the DMV is one of the most dangerous highways in the state? I've driven on it already, but I am just wondering if they would put it on the driver's test. Uh, gamer, if it was if it is within a five minute drive of the DMV, there is a high probability that you could be taken out on the highway. So yes, there is a high probability. It's up to the discretion of the examiner whether they take you on the highway or not, okay? Uh, Treads, thanks for all your help and answering my questions. Love your videos. Treads, thank you so much for the endorsement. That is awesome, my friend. All the best. V, awesome, thank you for the reply. Also, I have great difficulty when trying to park. I feel like it's something I never get. Normally, you have a slim idea at first, but for me, it's an empty mind. Okay, so V, uh, trying to reverse park or parallel park, I would suggest you work in a parking lot where there aren't that many vehicles or go and get some pylons and work with some pylons in the parking lot and just get used to where the vehicle is in relation to other objects, you know, light standards, pylons, and those types of things. The great thing about working with pylons or working with those delineators, 36 inch, one meter tall delineators, is that if you hit one, it's not a big deal, right? It's not like hitting another car or hitting a light standard or whatnot. So I greatly encourage you to work with pylons and that'll help you out with your parking as well. Those slow speed maneuvers will improve your overall uh, driving skills. All right, so if you are going for a driver's test, if there's anything I can do to help you out, uh, drop me a note in the comments below. Head over to the Smart Drive Test website. Check out Pass Your Driver's Test First Time Course Package. It includes both the Winter Driving and Defensive Driving Smart courses. Uh, you can pick that package, that course package up for about 38 bucks. We throw in the bonus courses as well. Guaranteed to pass your driver's test first time. Corey's put the link up there in the comments, so definitely have a look at that. 
Bella Tony, uh, your videos are actually so helpful. I just passed my road test first try two weeks ago, and thank you so much for stopping by and letting us know. Congratulations on passing your license. Yay! <laughs> that is so awesome. And uh, what did you do to celebrate uh, passing your driver's test? Uh, Mallory here in Nova Scotia, we also have front license plates, okay? So you do as well, are weird. Uh, and as Sam says, just keep practicing and you're going to get better. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Saskatchewan, the full license from 12 to 6 months. A lot of the U.S. states have the GDL program as well, the graduated driver's license. In Canada, they call it the GLP, which is it's the same thing. It's the graduated driver's license. And many U.S. states are 180 days on the learner's phase, which is six months. And I think that the learner's phase doesn't need to be a year. A year is just crazy. It only needs to be 180 days. Could even be 90 days and it would still be fine. Because all this is done, the graduated licensing program has simply postponed at what age drivers get a license now. It hasn't improved driver's abilities and the way that they get a license because most drivers just get their learners and then they wait the year and they wait six to eight weeks before they start practicing for their driver's test anyway. They're not, it's not the reality of what governments thought that it was going to be that drivers would be driving for a full year. They're actually not driving for a full year. They're just practicing for the driver's test to be able to pass. Uh, Laura, what do I need to do for the written portion of the driver's test? Uh, Laura, first thing, do not read the driver's handbook cover to cover. Boring. If you want to cure insomnia, yes, read the driver's handbook cover to cover, but otherwise don't. Go on the website or on Google, type in practice driving test questions for wherever you are in the world, do the practice driving test questions, figure out where the gaps are in your knowledge, and then go to the driver's handbook. And if you're having problems with two-way stop signs, for example, or four-way stop signs, look up that information in the handbook and then go back and do the practice driving test questions again when you're getting 80 to 90 percent consistently on the practice driving test questions then you're ready to go in and write your test at the dmv all right <clears throat> uh joe said a year is just crazy agree 100 percent. yeah i totally agree too joe a year is too long at the learner's face uh tyler now in bc it's two years for the learner's license uh, Tyler, when did that come into effect? Because I hadn't heard that uh, had the, heard that adjustment yet. Uh, Mallory, do you want your car and you look professional f uh, for when you go for your road test? Yes, you do. So clean your car, give it a vacuum. Uh, v, I uh, just started driving like two weeks ago. I'm doing this thing where I drive 50 hours, 10 at night, and do six hours worth of lessons with this instructor, all part of the school. Uh, all of that's going to be really great and get you ready for your driver's test, V, so you're going to be absolutely ready. Crystal, the board members got tired of hearing people that were speaking the truth about all the mandates, so they decided to cut us off 20 minutes early. Uh, sorry to hear that. Yeah, unfortunately, they're the ones doing the decision-making. Uh, Juliana, you got sushi. <laughs> that's awesome. Hopefully you shared it with a friend because, you know, those kinds of celebrations of passing your driver's test should always be celebrated with friends and family because it's just such, such an awesome, awesome achievement. You're never going to get your driver's license again, right? I mean, unless you do what I did and became a professional driving instructor and, you know, got my class D, got my class B, my class A, my driving instructor's license and had to do lots of driver's tests. And, of course, moved to other countries and had to do driver's tests in other countries. So <laughs> all of that going on. Uh, Ray, road test tomorrow in Mississauga. Wish me luck. Good luck on your driver's test there in Mississauga tomorrow. That is absolutely awesome. Teen, I would love to learn manual. I have a class five, but do you have any advice to learn manual? Would love to learn it so much. Uh, teen, we actually have a whole playlist on how to drive manual transmission. And the first thing you need to learn is clutch control. You need to learn where the friction point is. And the friction point is the point where the clutch begins to engage the engine with the drivetrain and the vehicle starts to move forward. So the hardest part of learning manual transmission is first gear and reverse gear. After you learn first and reverse, it's pretty straightforward after that. So do that, have a look at the uh, playlist. Corey will put those up for you and that'll get you going uh, with learning how to drive a manual transmission. Now, 
be careful with the manual transmission because the thing about learning manual transmission and you do it for a couple of months, you don't ever wanna go back to an automatic. And if you're like me, my girlfriend Tracy has a very nice Audi S4, but it's got an automatic transmission. It would love to have an Audi S4 with a manual transmission in it, but they stopped making them in 2012. So if you want an Audi <laughs> with a manual transmission in it, they're actually more expensive. <laughs> so know that, that that's the danger of learning how to drive manual transmission is, is that you don't want to go back to an automatic after that. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, yes, uh, Corey, you'll need to be a learner for at least 12 months before you can take a road test and graduate to the next level. Yes, before you can get your learners uh, before you can get your probationary license. Yes, I hadn't heard that two years yet, so I don't think that's true about the province of British Columbia, that they're moving the learners up to uh, two years. All right, so we're gonna leave it there for tonight. Uh, make sure you check out Pass Your Driver's Test first time course package, guaranteed to pass your driver's test, and the bonus courses of Defensive Driving Smart and the Winter Driving Smart courses. Thank you so much for all of your great questions, helping out new drivers, passing your driver's test, and sharing your success in passing your driver's test. All of that is absolutely awesome. You passed the driver's test in the last couple of weeks. Congratulations. And if you have a driver's test coming up this week or next week, good luck on that. And remember, pick the best answer. Not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. All the best. Bye now.